It's a time to invite the discussants. We have two discussants. First, we have uh, Professor Shin Jong Ho of Education at SNU, and we also have a uh, Professor Hong Song Ho in the Social Sciences from SNU. We'll first like to invite the Professor Shin Jong Ho. Please give him a big hand. As introduced, I am a Shin Jong Ho, member of the National Strategic Committee and SNU. The director Kim Jin Suk from Carist made a very good presentation on the implication of the COVID-19 for education. So how the education field in Korea has been responding to and will be preparing for the future of education was uh, quite well presented in the presentation. If I add on a few things to her presentation, the biggest challenge posed by the COVID-19 outbreak is that it's a time for us to re-examine the education that is provided by the schools. Uh, the first problem was that physically the school was closed. And worldwide, there are billions of students who are not able to attend school physically. And according to UNESCO, as of early May, 1.3 billion students were not able to attend school physically. And but fortunately, around 400 million students were able to benefit from online learning. But still, hundreds of millions of people are not getting the proper education that they should were supposed to get from school. We were supposed to resume school at mid-March, but as mentioned in the presentation, it was uh, pushed back three times again, and we re uh, started the online classes. Even during the Korean War, the school was not closed, but because of the COVID-19, for the first time in our history, the school was closed physically. And starting with the first start, we start with the third grader of high school. And now only one third of the students are attending physically, and the remaining two thirds are getting education online. So the school shut down, provide us with an alternative of online learning, but there are the many challenges that are lying ahead. And UNESCO suggested the many concerns in relation with the online learning and online education. When the education was not able to be provided by the physical school, that how well are we prepared to provide the online education and how effective is it that we provide education online? And there might be the second wave of the COVID-19. And if that takes place, that we have to improve the quality of online education. And because of school shutdown, the burden of parents increased, and that led to the educational disparities among students. And er early during the COVID-19, the many people were allowed to work from home, so the parents were able to supervise their children at home. That, as I mentioned, that only one third of the students are attending school physically, so two thirds of students are still at home, which means that only two weeks out of three weeks that you can attend school, that and the remaining time you were at home. And if the proper supervision is not provided by the parents, they might have the potential issues such as learning loss. And at the moment, there might be the another issues that there might be the more dropouts or the teenager delinquency issue might arise more because of the COVID-19. So we should also come up with a better measures to deal with such social issues. 
and distance education and distance learning is provided as the alternative. And as presented in the presentation of Director Kim, I think that Korea is doing a very good job. In the United States, the school shutdown has continued till this moment. And if you look at the situation in the US, in California, the 1.2 million students do not have the digital devices at home or do not have the internet connection available for them to get education online. And because of the income difference, that disparity is deepened between the high income families and the low income families. And the families with an annual average income of uh, 25,000, and if you compare those families with the families with the income level of uh, over 100,000, that you see there is a 10 times difference in the education efficiency and the the how the students are able to attend the online education. Now we have strengthened our online education platform in Korea. And what was startling was, as mentioned by Director Kim, that within just a month, that we were able to bolster the server to accommodate the many, uh, a lot more users. Within just a month, that we were able to increase the server's capacity to accommodate uh, around 3 million users. And that was uh, quite an achievement that we have made. And the content provided by the teachers was the 40 million contents were created by the teachers. And we have around 400,000 teachers. And which means that each teacher created around 100 educational contents. And there was a survey conducted in the US on the teachers. Would you like to go back to school after the COVID-19 outbreak? And the 20% res uh, responded they would like to change job because being a teacher was really tough during the COVID-19 outbreak. But how the Korean teachers are doing amid the COVID-19 outbreak, it's really amazing. And there were many issues related to the socially disadvantaged. And I think that we have been responding well to address this issue as well. And how the teachers and the parents perceive the online learning was a well presented by Director Kim, but I would like to view it from the perspective of the students. And there is a school jam the mobile platform and the elementary, middle, and high school students were surveyed there. And if you look at the findings of the survey, overall, the, they give six out of 10 points. Then they are like a somewhat satisfied with the quality of online education. And for elementary school, they are quite satisfied. But if you look at the responses by middle and high school students, they are not very much satisfied by the quality of education that they get online. Even if they're satisfied with the online education, that the student did not say that they are satisfied with the quality of the educational contents. They rather like it because they do not have to go to school every day. That was the major reason that they like online education. It does not necessarily mean that they are quite satisfied with the quality of education online. And the reason that they are not satisfied when we ask why, they cannot concentrate for long. So after 10 minutes, it's a really tough for them to concentrate, and they are not really motivated. It's not the problem with the students, uh, the elementary or middle high school student. It's the same for the undergraduate as well. When we had a survey on the undergrads at SNU, they say they get discouraged as well. I do not feel uh, that they responded that I do not feel like I want to attend the online classes. 
they are not really motivated. So it was the same for the undergraduates at the universities. So how we will motivate the students to concentrate on the online classes uh, if we do not address that issue that we cannot continue with the distance learning. And if we're going to continue with the online classes after the COVID-19, that the proper support needs to be provided. Major reason that students are not satisfied with the online learning is that the link is provided to the student and student have to click on the link to watch the video online. And if the educational content is delivered in this way, they are not really satisfied with the online education. So the teacher themselves should create the content. But uh, the teacher that I know that uh, had to spend 20 hours to prepare the 30-minute lessons. So how are we going to compensate for compensate for the efforts of the teachers, and how are we going to address that issue? If I, without finding the issue to that, that we cannot continue with the online education. And you said that many contents were uploaded by the teachers, and some of them will be of good quality, and some of them may not be. And we should build an integrated platform, putting together many different educational material provided by the teachers. And we should also monitor the learning loss to prevent the learning loss of the students. And there should be the right assessment prepared to measure how efficient online learning is. At high schools and at universities, that we should review the right measures to address the issues that we have and even after the COVID-19, what will be the challenges that remained needs to be examined as well. So even after the COVID-19 outbreak, if there is the second or the third wave of the COVID-19, that we should be able to provide a better quality online classes to the students. Due to the time constraints, I think I should conclude my presentation here. And I, I will share more in the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shin jong ho I was able to feel how passionate you are about the Korean education. So now I would like to invite the next discussant, Professor Hong Sang-wook of Biosciences from SNU. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. science uh, technology and the history of uh, science technology is being studied by me. So hello everyone, I am Hong Song wook professor of Seoul National University in the, in the Department of Biological Sciences. The previous speaker uh, talked about uh, COVID-19 and uh, education uh, from a very philosophical uh, perspective. So I'd like to make a continuation of that kind of um, topic. When a person sick, gets sick and uh, the person has a tendency to look back on the past. For example, when I am sick, you know, I try to figure out what I have done in the past and questioning why uh, I'm sick and questioning what uh, has made me sick. Is it because of too much drinking or is it because of uh, too much work? So that kind of reflection is being made when we are sick. The crisis posed by COVID-19 has made us do the same. And it makes us to think about from where we did wrong. The COVID-19 pandemic 
has touched upon the peak of the civilizations that we have established, especially from uh, for the 20 centuries. The area that is hit hardest is uh, international tourism. The global tourism sector has been hit hardest. There are many empty airports. Of course, every sector of the economy is feeling the difficulty posed by COVID-19. However, above all, the airports and the international tourism is the sector that is being hit hardest. But from when did we start traveling to overseas countries? So between the U.S. and Europe, the airway, the uh, flight routes in, were introduced in 1960, uh, so as, as seen in the case of uh, Boeing 707. So that opened the era of travel. So general citizens uh, began to take flights in order to go to other countries. But what about other? elements. Where is the area that is being hit hard by COVID-19? And we can find the answer among the aged, those aged over 60, over the age of 60 or 70, especially those with underlying medical problems. There are, of course, young people who are in their 20s. However, when you take a look at the death statistics, it is rare to find uh, people in many numbers in their 20s. But there are many senior citizens who are dying of uh, COVID-19, especially the death rate among the aged is high in Europe. Half, more than half of the, uh, those who lose their lives are senior citizens in Europe. Life span or ex life expectancy has been increasing. In the 1960s, uh, life has been lengthened thanks to the introduction of so uh, antiviral agents. And since the 1960s, the life expenses has grown not related to uh, the mother and uh, infant mortality ratio uh, in uh, the in reduction actually the life expectancy has grown since uh, 1960 thanks to the lengthened lifespan of senior, senior citizens so it was possible because of the medical improvements and also the uh, because of the environmental elements so that was um, considered uh, one of the most um, high highest achievements we have made however in this case in the covid-19 situation that achievement is being hit hardest and we have built up a human civilization so far and in the process we have developed many kinds of science scientific technologies but now we are in trouble we are in a crisis so now it's time for us to look back and reflect on ourselves to figure out from where we did wrong during the pandemic crisis including myself, you know, many people are uh, feeling hopes and desperations at the same time. And uh, people are trying to find hope from the possibility of developing vaccine. So nearly every day we see the uh, press release or reports that uh, some kind of companies are working on development of vaccine and uh, it is likely to succeed. By the end of this year, a vaccine is likely to be uh, developed. This kind of anticipation and expectations um, exist these days a lot. However, whether or not that will be reality, uh, whether or not that will be reali re realized uh, is not certain at this point. And even if the, there is a vaccine development, that vaccine may not be effective. There are such opinions. And even if there is a therapeutic agent, it is maybe it would work only for treating symptoms, not the uh, cause of the uh, virus. 
So the vaccine development, when it comes to vaccine development, uh, people are not very hopeful. Even after the vaccine development, uh, there is a kind of the anticipation that uh, vaccine development will not put an end to this uh, pandemic. For everything, there is a starting point and there is an ending point. So because of that, you know, people are thinking by when uh, this COVID-19 situations will be ended. But if there is a no end to it, how can lead? How can we lead our lives? If we keep thinking like that, we cannot maintain our lives. So that's the thinking of many people. So that's why there are people who are already considering that COVID-19 is in the process of being ended. Because if we don't think like that, we cannot maintain or sustain our lives because you know, there is no end in the in this tunnel. So throughout our history, we have gone through those kind of cases. The virus, any virus and uh, bacteria was not defeated by humans in our history. So there is no clear case where we can say that we won over bacteria. However, maybe there could be just one example. Uh, but so for example, the smallpox. Maybe if, when it comes to smallpox, we can say that if we have won over the uh, war against the smallpox. However, smallpox is different because it's not genotic. But uh, the coronavirus, this one is genotic. In the previous presentation, the speakers already talked about the desperation felt by people. However, in, the, in this situation, somebody or someone is getting more power than the others. So the common thing that we can figure out in this COVID-19 situation is that more and more nations are growing their power in the process of prevention and uh, in the process of um, control of the COVID-19. The government is getting more power and the civil society is uh, have, has less power. So we often use the term or expression uh, K prevention or K prevention and control measures. So the K uh, quarantine stands for tracing and preventive measures. So by using the technology that we have, we are able to uh, figure out uh, the traces of contacts by using uh, base stations of the telecommunication service. We uh, are able to figure out uh, the pathway of traces. Even after the pandemic crisis, uh, this kind of uh, usage of information or technologies will continue. Spanish flu uh, hit the world, uh, uh, like uh, sweeping the United States and Europe at the time, uh, 50 million people lost their lives. According to a study of the Spanish flu, for the period of Spanish flu, that is, that was in 1918 and 1919, the generation who experienced the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919, they have less academic capabilities and also physically they are weaker than the other generations according to the result of the city. If the COVID virus goes on for more than one year, the generation who faced the coronavirus probably is likely to become weaker than the other generation. Maybe this is the matter that we need to research you know, after we put an end to the COVID-19 uh, situation. So that is the, uh, the my presentation. So let me address more questions during a Q&A session. Thank you for your attention. Professor Hong, thank you very much. Now I would like to invite the presenters and discussants all together to, work, uh, to the stage to have the final discussion and the Q&A session.
First, Professor Shin Jong Ho, would you like to ask a question to Director Kim? And then I will give the Hong, Professor Hong a chance to ask a question. Uh, when Director Kim presented, it was mentioned, and I've also mentioned in my discussion, too. The around 4,000 educational contents that were created, and we need the system to integrate and better manage such a educational contents created. And in the Korean New Deal, the education was selected as the important sector, and in the third supplementary budget appropriation next year, and the content archive will be getting a lot of budget in the process. So by changing the curriculum a bit, the teachers can benefit from the content archive that is to be established and can, can provide the educa quality educational contents to the students. And that process is now ongoing. I think we should do a good job in doing that. And uh, Professor Park Jong Hwa came up with the new the need for a new philosophy in uh, in the times of uh, new uh, situations. I, um, I I agree with you on on the point, but not only the scientists, but also the experts of humanities and uh, those related to religious uh, sector. So all the concerned people need to pull uh, the power together. So we need to work together. So that is the thinking that. Uh, comes across my mind. But how is it possible yeah, going beyond your own sector, collaborating with the others in other sectors, not just a cooperation, it's a very close cooperation. Uh, so how is that kind of cooperation possible in building up a new education system? So how specifically would that be possible? So is there anything that on your mind? Simply put, actually, um, I cannot give you a simple answer to that question. So from my childhood, I was very interested in psychology, like uh, children's psychology and uh, the psychology of mass people. So what I felt from my research is that there are differences between people who are raised based on rational education and those who don't. But however, there is the only sector that would enable cooperation, that is the education sector. So we have a different individuals. Um, each individual has a sovereignty, but without that sovereignty, we cannot communicate with each other. We cannot discuss with each other. Science-centered philosophy should be at the center of the society. And then religion, customs, and historical elements can be you know, um, combined together is as part of the cooperation. However, if the case is opposite, such cooperation is, cannot be possible. Thank you very much. I do have a question to the presenters, so I would like to ask a question. First to Director Kim. In the findings of the survey that you've shown that the parents responded that that there's a no one uh, said so they do not have the time or the capacity to supervise their children's learning. So that was somewhat concerning. And if the parents, they have to spend a lot of time making a living, that it might be even tougher for them. So the burden will be even heavier for the such parents. And for the parents who do not uh, have a digital literacy, it might be tough for them as well. And the socially disadvantaged, then we'll have uh, such issues. And if 
we are going to continue with the online learning, how are we going to address such issues? Yes, economic inequality lead to the inequalities in education. That has been happening throughout the history. But the digital divide and digital inequality has been mentioned a lot with the COVID-19. It was actually the digital means was actually introduced as the means to narrow the income disparities. But how, but ironically, that presented another, another issue. Yes, to prepare f for the potential second wave of the COVID-19 that we should address such issues. And if you look at the cases of the OECD countries that we are ranked lowest among the OECD countries. So we should increase access to online learning. And the students from the multicultural families and the socially disadvantaged that we had uh, many issues. And at home, the digital literacy and the access to the digital contents. Yes, we are providing the computers to the socially disadvantaged. And the bottom 30% of the low income families are provided with uh, laptops. So we are making sure that Regardless of the income level, the older families should uh, have a digital device. And uh, do you know that how many students are out of school? That the 570,000 and 580,000 students are now out of school, and they are dropping out of school. So how we will? provide learning opportunities for such dropout and the students out of school that I think we can increase the level of education that is available online. Then we can provide the more opportunities, more educational opportunities to the students that are out of school. Yes, we well, once we have identified the problems that we can solve it. Yet yeah, in terms of policy that you might think that building the infrastructure and building the system will be all, but that's not that. We have to have the specific measures to address such issues. And after the COVID-19, the educational disparities will emerge as a really important issue. When we think about the efficacy of online learning, the socially disadvantaged and the students from the low-income families are suffering the most and not getting the benefit that they should get from online learning. The students from the multicultural families and the students from the families with uh, families of the defectors from North Korea, which I think we might come up with uh, like uh, solutions. For example, we can have them attend the physical schools. Like we can come up with the other alternatives to provide the needed education for such students as well. Thank you very much. Uh, to Professor Park, I'd like to ask you a question. So as a philosopher, um, I was really you know, like the fact that you talked about philosophy. And I really felt good. And I thought it was a good idea to invite you to this forum. And however, as you know, the philosopher, sometimes the philosophers are critical, you know, trying to find any uh, fault in um, every statement. So I'd like to uh, give you a question. There are viruses and microorganisms. However, um, it was mentioned that we cannot fight against them. We need to find a way to live with them. So symbiosis was emphasized by you. So I agreed on that. However, for example, say that I have been infected with COVID-19. So in that case, I would not think, OK, you came to me in a good manner. OK, I need to live with you. I need to do good. So it's, I'm not going to be like that. So if you are a person with the risk of losing your life, you know, how, what would you do or how would you approach 
So how would you deal with the two different, two conflicting situations? I think it depends on which con in which country you are. Uh, so Switzerland, Sweden and Korea would have reacted to that differently. So ultimately, what I mean by symbiosis or mutual existence is not the one that we need to live together, you know, literally. So I'd like to give more focus on the way of processing information. What I mean by that, we need to live together with bacteria. That means that we need to have a better understanding about how the virus processes information. We need to have a better understanding and clear understanding of the viruses, how they are processing information. But the same goes to coronavirus. And uh, after some time, they will be with us, and they will not just go away. So, uh, and after some time, immunity will be created in the future. But what I mean by living together with them is that we need to know better with each other. That's what I mean. Yeah, please, please have a comment. So when I um, catch a cold, we think that uh, I, I got a I, the the cold has come down to me, and I need to overcome this. I need to get over it. Yeah, that's the way we think when it comes to you know catching a f cold. So, but actually, the coronavirus may be different. So, I think the ca cases are different. And when I make an interpretation of um, Professor Park's comment, what is important to us is that actually the COVID-19 crisis has given us an opportunity to once again recognize that the world, this world, is based on interactions and relations of different elements, including humans and viruses. And uh, the relations or the combination consists of the elements that we know and the elements that we didn't know before. So as for humans and as for the things that we didn't know before, uh, we are now able to think about how how all of that work. So as a human, we have the, the kind of opportunity to think, think about to think about those matters thanks to COVID-19. So autogenesis, some um, Autopolyasis uh, is a, a concept introduced by one scholar. Uh, I think we need to uh, uh, go beyond that, like symbiosis. So move beyond autogenesis, and we need to think about the symbiosis, you know, um, existing together and living together, so mutual existence. So symbiosis is the one that we need to consider taking this opportunity. We have prepared uh, the online questions uh, as well. So let's uh, take a look. There are many good questions raised. Let's try to answer the first question. Yes, the strengthening the quality of online learning will be really important, but the exposure to the media well, might have uh, side effects, so uh, we should be able to evaluate the effectiveness of the online educational contents. Uh, I would like to know the opinions of the expert. I would like to put it a bit differently. And as mentioned by Professor Shin jong ho the students were not really satisfied, even if the contents were really good. The, it was the, just the delivery of the quality educational content through the link. So when we had asked the students, it was that it depended on how the teachers use the educational contents available online. So how the teachers are guiding their students' learning and how they're engaging their students in learning processes and what kind of feedbacks were provided to the students. And depending on that, the student satisfaction uh, was a different. So it was not the evaluation on the content itself. It was more on the evaluation on how the teachers guide the students' learning. 
So the quality of online content, yeah, to improve that, that we should just not let the teachers to create their own contents. We should uh, create the contents together. All the teachers should get together to create the contents, like how we do and how we facilitate this Q&A session. So it should not be just one single teacher accountable for their all classes that we can bring together the many different teachers to prepare the contents for the each subject. And how about you too? How about in terms of inclusivity, in expanding the inclusivity that we would like to give you the chance to respond? In this semesters, I have provided a real-time basis education lecture to students, and one of the response from the students, uh, which is which was interesting, is that there was a discussion time between ten to twenty students. Usually, in a classroom, uh, the professor or teacher is in front of the classroom, and when there's a discussion uh, among students before the pandemic and the students could not see with each other because the desks actually were poised to the direction of uh, teachers. So the students used to just look at the face of the professor or teacher. But now that we are doing online lecture, students are able to see each other's face. And they could identify who raised a uh, hand for questioning. So that's well known thanks to online learning. So in some senses, you know, there are people, students, who are saying that there are advantages of online learning. Sometimes I record a video, and the video is uploaded. But sometimes I did um, lecture on a real-time basis. According to a survey, the satisfaction uh, level of real-time basis lecture is 80 or 90 percent of that of real uh, on-site education. However, the satisfaction level for pre-recorded video lecture is quite low. But it's been like one semester since we did online learning. Now more and more, I have gained know-how, and I. I find that uh, some of the things, oh, I, this is the one, uh, the things that I can uh, carry, carry on in the next semester. So I gained some kind of know-how. And these kind of know-hows uh, can be shared between teachers. So that would be good for everybody because there were, uh, would be the prolongation of the pandemic. So uh, the students actually, they did turn on the video. Yes, I asked them to turn it on. So at university, students did not uh, sh show their faces uh, on online classes. But elementary school and middle and high schools, it had become more horizontal. The, the relationship between teachers and students became horizontal thanks to the online learning. And in the class, you were not able to see the student who are sitting in the back, but by providing teaching uh, online, the many teachers responded that they were able to have uh, more the horizontal relationship. So if you have a student up to like a 10 or a 20, then it's a really good. But at university, there are some courses that uh, have uh, students like over 100 or 200. Then it's a really difficult to see all the faces of the students. So I think that there is another interesting question as well. And uh, the question at the bottom uh, sounds interesting as well. What about the page number three? It seems that there is high level interest in education. So let's go back to page one. Yes. Sean E on YouTube ask this question. I think that this is a core question that will receive the attention of everyone. So one of the concerns um, um, felt in the process of online learning was uh, that in uh, the high school students who are 
on the brink, uh, who's, who, are, who will have the uh, examinations to enter the university, they are very concerned. So what do you think about uh, the current situations? What should be the changes that we need to pursue? And the college exam has been the issue in Korea for very long. So it's an issue that needs uh, really careful deliberation. But at, uni at high school, the course credit system is being talked about a lot as the alternative at the moment. So there might be the many diverse perspectives or diverse options that can be considered. So now universities look more into the what kind of experience the student had. They are not just looking at the store scores of the students. So by introducing the course credit system at high schools that we can address such issues, I believe that course credit system will likely to be uh, talked about a lot as an alternative. And 2030, the college exam is being reviewed at the Ministry of Education. And yes, the, co the credit, the system is uh, now mentioned as an alternative. So at now, we have a uniformed curriculum, but the students will be able to choose the course that they would like to take at high school. And what kind of courses they have chosen to take can also be reviewed and evaluated by the universities when they choose the students. And that issue will, I believe, will be discussed even further. And so the college exam for the third graders of high school, and what will be the advantages and disadvantages for the third graders now? So now, their the scores and their the evaluation result will be reflected in their college exams. So, but for this time, the third grader, what will be the the things that will be evaluated by the universities? So. They are suggesting some of the solutions uh, that the Ministry of Education is considering the, some of the solutions. So how we can improve the current college admissions system to choose the right students at the universities. So we should have this kind of uh, social discussions. And the college exam, and if the curriculum is improved, that will be the new kind of college admission that we can introduce. Thank you. And since education is being talked about a lot, I would like to ask a question to Professor Park. So there were many elements uh, for which, uh, on which I agree with you, um, uh, Professor Park. So there could be still, there could be a skepticism about the effect of education. So there was a kind of the um, not favorable feelings of Americans, some Americans, about wearing face masks. And it is evident that wearing face mask is more effective in preventing and controlling the diseases. And uh, there is evidence, uh, clear, clear evidence that uh, wearing face, ma face mask is good. But in some uh, countries or some Americans actually they reject uh, the idea of wearing face masks. So maybe this is related to education. So what is your take on this matter? I think that the example you took uh, shows the uh, problems uh, faced by the American education way. And um, the America uh, is going backwards. And there is a lack of diversity now in the United States. Lack of diversity is also seen in the Korean education system. What is really sad about is that there is no inclusiveness. For example, when I take questions and when I give questions uh, to students, I want to know their thinking or I want to know their idea. However, their answer is SAT-centric. 
I think that kind of problem is vivid in、uh, the American education system as well. So there is a one prodigy who used to be good at、uh, things. So that person was about to become a NASA person. However, in the middle, academic capability or capability went down. So that represents one of the problems of education system. So we need to be concerned about the same possibility, where our education can go back, just like the way、uh, America did. Thank you.、Uh, thank you for your discussion. And the SNU National Strategy Committee has prepared the second COVID-19 forum. Now it's time to put an end to this forum on the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like to thank the two speakers and two discussants for their active participation in the session three, and also I'd like to express my gratitude to the audience online. I really hope that the COVID-19 situations can be put on end in a quick manner. However, it seems、uh, far from reality in this situation. Many people, including myself. Are working on coming up with ways to wisely cope with the situation, to wisely overcome the situations. I could see many people's willingness、uh, to work on that, so it made me feel warm-hearted. And once again, I'd like to thank you for your participation. Thank you.